You're watching Power Nation. Welcome to Power Nation Builds. You Mopar fans are in for a treat as we have a rescued 1970 Challenger. Here's Detroit Muscle. In recent months, we've combed the countryside looking for Detroit treasures, exploring boneyards and barns. We played detective by decoding cars to reveal their factory origins. We've shared tips on how to look for project candidates. And mostly, we've just got a kick out of seeing what we could uncover. But this time, we mean business. In fact, we're on a serious hunt for our next project vehicle. Yeah, we've got word from a friend of a friend of a friend that's got several of those project cars. So we thought we'd come check him out. We came prepared. We got some cash in a trailer and hoping we go home with something. Something like this. 1970 Challenger RT, one of the most desirable sought after muscle cars in the world. Of course, some people would refer to this one as a basket case. At first glance, it can be really intimidating, but the beauty behind buying a car in this style condition was some of the work of disassembly's already done, and you get to see exactly what the condition of the body is in. It's kind of like this shifter hole here. Now I can tell you it looks like somebody's cut it out with a torch and a pair of vice grips, but it's no big deal, it can be repaired. But you would never see this with a shifter boot and the carpet laying in place. Well, this old Challenger's missing an engine and trans, which is fine with us, because we got plans we'll tell you about later. It's also missing a fender tag, which usually goes there, that tells you about all the options. Not to worry, though, still got the VIN number, and that tells us a lot, too. Well, a little rust like this, no big deal. A car like this, I'm kind of excited. What do you think? Yeah, if the doors and fender is as nice as the car itself, we've got us a candidate. We'll just have to see if we can get it home today. Let's go talk to him. Getting the deal done was a lot easier than getting the Challenger out of the lot and onto our trailer. But at last, we're homeward bound with what promises to be our most exciting project ever. Well, we made it back to the shop in one piece with our newly acquired 70 Challenger. Of course, it's in several pieces and happy to say that the fenders and doors like the rest of the body we showed you are in great condition considering well, they're almost 45 years old. Case in point, no rust at the bottom of this door, especially in the corner where you often find it in cars this old. And looks like original paint too. We'll start with the easy stuff. All the pieces that aren't attached and the accessible bits like the hood hinges. Everything we're removing is going to be gently laid out and accounted for. Some of this won't be reused, but a lot of it will. And you don't want to accidentally destroy a piece that can't be bought, especially you resto guys. The steering column gets detached from the box, then a couple of bolts mean it can be removed. The dash is a little more involved with some pretty tricky bolts to deal with. But like everything else, it comes out too. Then the heater box is an easy picture, as well as the pedal assembly. Now we can move on to the rear suspension. This leaf spring setup is a pretty familiar configuration for muscle cars. We'll unbolt the shackles on the back of them. Then the front perch can be removed with four bolts. And the rear end is now detached from our Mopar. Since we're about to head to the blaster, we'll put the body on a rotisserie to make moving it and blasting it a whole lot easier. And a couple days later, ours is back from the blaster. We've got a good bit of metal work ahead of us, including a roof replacement, but we expected that. 
You know, it's a funny thing, but we've had talks about what we like about the 1970 Dodge Challenger even before we got one. And we also talked about how we could make a great thing even greater. We like the unmistakable shaker hood option, and we like the fact that they were built to go fast with engine options like the 440 and 426 Hemi. We also like the idea of a manual four on the floor trans with a pistol grip shifter. And the fact they came in such bright, crazy colors. How could we improve from the original? How about taking that old school Hemi and slapping on some fuel injection and then taking that cool pistol grip shifter and adding a couple gears with a six speed. We also want to upgrade the brakes and suspension of this ride by making it drive and ride like a modern performance car. And either way you're doing a ride like this, it's always a good idea to keep a clear picture of this thing in your mind or on paper. So here it is, thanks to this awesome rendering done by our friend Dale Swanson at Swanson Artworks, who does a lot of our pre-built art. The color's what the factory called Plum Crazy Purple in 1970. So we're proudly naming our project car Ultraviolet. He even gave us a personal slant on the classic RT stripes. So that's our game. Take the iconic parts of this car and ramp them up to the max. Like any great project, you gotta tear it down before you build it up. The beauty of the shear bit is how it makes super quick work of that sheet metal. But if you're not careful, it can also be its drawback. Right now, we're just trying to cut the skin of the roof. We don't wanna get into the structural pieces or the edge where the spot wells are. Leaving a small strip still attached to the car with those spot welds, once I get all the way around the roof, the skin peels right off, kind of like an orange. Well, here is some of that rot that Tommy referred to, and it's in several places around the roof, but it's something you'd have to expect from a 45-year-old car, and it's something easily remedied with a little patchwork. After marking the area that you want to cut out, with a cutting wheel on a grinder, the metal can be removed pretty easily. You want to cut a little bit outside of where the rot is, but don't get too crazy. You just make a bigger hole that will mean more work. A sanding disc is useful to help dress the area where the new panel will be welded in. And once we've replicated the curvature and shape of the old one, we can begin fitting it. Since this part of the car isn't flat, you'll want to tack the piece and shape the metal to fit. Once it's laid down flush with a stock panel, you can tack it in the rest of the way and begin welding it in for good. Maybe wondering why I cut this off here instead of leaving it one long piece. Well, I've got to replace this A pillar and I don't want to be fighting it, so I just went ahead and sliced it and we'll fix it later. Once it's welded in, we'll dress the welds with a grinder and then repair the rest of the bad spot. With the rust treated, now we're ready to start fitting the A pillar. Once I got it in place, I'm gonna make a few marks so I can punch some holes in it for the plug welds. Then we'll be ready to weld this thing up and this calf will be roped. With the pillar in place, I can make a few marks for the holes that need to be put for the new spot welds. Then I'll grab our Madco metal punch make some holes till them cows come home. We've turned the corner now, and instead of deleting spot wells, we're making more of them. These old cars were held together by a ton of these things. After the wells are in place, a little bit of grinding will dress them up and flatten them down just like they need to be. Once all that's done, our new A-pillar is installed. Pretty excited about the whole deal. What do you guys think?
And now that the A-pillar work is behind us, we can start giving the Challenger a roof using those replacement parts we showed you earlier. Because of alignment issues, the roof skin's got to go on before the drip rails. Go ahead and get on up top. That's pretty good. Just need a clamp. I think this thing's gonna fit. The drip rail goes here under the roof skin, which, like I said, we'll use to locate the rail in its new home. A couple of tacks from the bottom side are a handy way to keep the rail in place after you pull the skin back off. You have to do that in order to access the top of the rail to place the spot weld. With the roof skin back in place, we can finally start getting it welded back to the car. There's just a few spot welds here, and then a few more here, and a few more right over here. Once those are burned in, you can cut those tacks off the bottom. Now, you don't have to address these wells. Nobody's gonna see them, but that's up to you. Stick around as Project Ultraviolet gets closer to becoming one wicked ride. So far on our 70 Challenger Project Ultraviolet, we've brought in some real heavy hitters like Jeff Schwartz from Schwartz Performance, who helped us install one of their G-Machine chassis. Then Russ Flagel from Indy Cylinder Head built us an all-aluminum Hemi for the old guy. So in keeping with that spirit, we're turning the body and paint work over to one of the best in the business. You've seen us work with Chris Ryan before. He's the guy that built this incredible 53 Cadillac root beer float, along with his team at Ryan's Rod and Custom in 96 South Carolina. He also lent us a hand on our giveaway Monte Carlo, as well as our giveaway bandit style Trans Am. What we're gonna do is take the body back to the shop. Uh, we're gonna evaluate the metal work that's been done to it, straighten up anything that needs to be done. Turn it back. I think the stripe's gonna be the most difficult part to lay out of it. Uh, we've kind of got some open rain to lay out the stripe. Oh, it's gonna be an awesome car. I mean, a, a 70s Mopar with a, with a 426 in it's iconic. Welcome to South Carolina, home of Ryan's Rod and Custom. These guys work on everything from pre-war restorations to muscle cars and street rides. The team has been real busy getting the Challenger prep for the paint work that's soon to come. The metal work was uh, pretty well done. We straightened it up a little bit and any other imperfections, we coated it with four coats of poly primer and continued more block sanding. And block sanded and block sanded and block sanded. What we have here is a copy of the rendering. You can see the white graphics on the side of the car. So our first step of this process is to spray this whole section here with the white base. The paint scheme for this car was designed by Dale Swanson at Dale Swanson Artworks, and he really knocked it out of the park for us, incorporating classic Mopar styling cues with a custom touch. This is the mid coat. Uh, this really doesn't have a lot of pigment into it. It's just basically an inner coat clear that's carrying the pearl itself. This is what's gonna give it the pop, the pizzazz on top of that white. We're getting ready to lay down the graphics on Project Ultraviolet. We're gonna use this yellow tape here as more of a measuring device. As we lay it on the body line, it'll give us perfect three quarters distance to lay up our actual strike tape. This green masking tape gives a sharper paint line than the yellow tape does, so that's what gets used to create the graphic. Once the edge is laid down, the yellow tape can go away. 
Another piece of the yellow tape is used to make a three quarter inch split in the graphic, creating the two lines. Chris is measuring to make sure that the lines will be even. After all, you can't be too particular when it comes to paint. An alternative way to do these graphics is to paint the car purple first, then mask the whole thing off, leaving the stripe area bare and spraying it white. But that involves a lot more taping. Yep. All right, we're getting ready to prep the Carolina Violet paint that was custom mixed by our friends at Single Source in Nashville. We considered a few different names for the shade of purple, which is a much more metallic and slightly more vibrant variation on the classic Mopar color, Plum Crazy Purple. We decided on Carolina Violet because, hey, it's getting painted in South Carolina, so why not? After multiple coats, the base has to dry just a bit before the tape can be pulled. So it's time for another break. Bring it up. This is the big reveal, where we get to see how the graphics turned out. Looking pretty good. Now the clear coat can be laid down. And after three coats, voila. We get this thing out in the sun and that Carolina Violet really pops. And those graphics that we duplicate the rendering, they look like they could have came straight out of a 70s Mopar with just a little bit of a twist. I think the car came out awesome. I love the updated look of a classic Mopar. Up next, our magnificent Mopar muscle monster hits the track. We've got our cone set up and we've got some pretty big plans for today. So we brought in a guest, Brian Finch. You all have seen him on the show before. He's helped out a lot with our projects. Brian, first thing today, what should we do? Well, with any new build, the first thing we want to do is baseline this car, right? Go out, put some lap down, take some times, take some measurements, and then uh, start adjusting, see if we can make it faster. So you're always, you know, you're always wanting to look a turn or two ahead to put your car in position. He's going to give us a rundown of how to handle this course. Stay nice and tight. Another 180, back around this way. He's also gauging the performance of the car. For example, he noticed our front tires are pushing in the corners a bit. There you go, straight ahead, straight ahead up here. Short shift in the second. Back and forth. Oh, that jam, huh? <laughs> a course like this takes a little getting used to, but after a couple of laps with Brian, you get a lot more confidence, as well as a better feel for the car. After adjusting camber, toe, and corner weights, Brian hits the course to see how ultraviolet will react. Already you can tell that there's a big difference in the way the car takes these corners. Less lean, no tire push, and now we can put that big Hemi to way more use. We've easily cut a few seconds off the time it takes to make it around the course.
It actually handles so much differently from before that driving it takes a little getting used to again. Looks like Tom got a little excited. We'll let him take another stab at it. This time he's looking a lot better. The clock doesn't lie, and what it's telling us is that those adjustments made all the difference in running the course faster. With more time, we could keep whittling it down even further, but this will do it for now. The Dodge ran pretty good, and it ran even better with the help of our buddy, Brian Finch. I want to say thank you again. Anytime, Tom. My pleasure. We'll let him finish up. Yeah, yeah. What a cool resto ride. Now I have a feeling Project Ultraviolet will be turning heads and turning corners fast. If it's high performance you're looking for, we've got you covered right here on Power Nation Builds.